month before I came on the police department, um, I, I was held up at gunpoint in where I lived. And my roommate's girlfriend, who he turned out Marion, she was with his two kids from a previous marriage. And they were followed home by this guy with a gun that stuck him up on the elevator. And they, we lived on the 12th floor. The elevator came up to the 12th floor. And this guy was in the elevator with them. And he had a bag of groceries covering the gun that he had already pulled on them. So when the elevator door opened, I was there with my brother. We both were bartenders. We were going to go to work. And uh, we, this scene, we, we were confronted with this scene of my roommate's girlfriend and these two kids. And you could see the terror on their faces. But we didn't, you know, we knew something was horribly wrong, but we just sort of instinctively didn't jump at anything right there. If we would have jumped them right there, we would have got shot, you know? Yeah. So anyway, we wound up going into the apartment and then he dropped the bag of groceries, stuck the gun in my face. And uh, my brother, who was like 5'10", about two and a quarter, a savage you would not want to tangle with, he was in the hall and he says, call him in here. So he, I got him in there. And I want, to, I want to speed this up. Like a long story short, he robs us. Then he wants to tie us up. And I was like, in my mind, I said, this robbery is over. I am not getting tied up. There is no way. So he was nervous and he was moving the gun back and forth. I nailed him across the chest with my forearm at the same time grabbed the gun. And as soon as I did that, he started firing at us. And he fired four shots. And my brother who was behind me hit us both with like a, you know, a body block. And we went flying into the vestibule. I'm still trying to hold on to his arm and had the gun in it. And I didn't know at that point, my brother got shot in the stomach. Ooh. And uh, anyway, we disarmed him, beat the shit out of him and held him to the police. That was a month before I came on the police department. Crikey. Uh, wow. And like, did your brother come good? Like, I mean, what happened? He that? came through it. Yeah, I think that he came through it physically. And yeah, I think emotionally down the road, you know, he, you know, when you get shot, people don't tell you the psychological part of getting shot. You know what I mean? It's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of psychological dealings with the fact that someone tried to take your life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's true. And, and mate, um, yeah, well, all those coppers you're losing over there, what's you know, six so far in 2020? Well, you know what it is? Um, uh, you, a lot of this has to do with politics. It's the whole defund the police movement. Cops are afraid to do their job. Cops are afraid to be aggressive. Cops are they're much um, too nice, I think. You know, And um, these cops were, were the victim of a career criminal with a gun that he shouldn't have had. Uh, they were at a domestic violence thing, and the guy had it in his mind he was just going to execute two cops, and that's what he did. They were just, you know, uh, they were executed, basically. And um, thank God for the third cop that he didn't know was there. That guy took his life, which was great. He killed the, he killed the perp, you know. Mm. And uh, But look, the United States is a proliferation of guns, of illegal guns, I should say. Um, and one side, the Democrats, their idea is to write more anti-gun legislation, but do nothing about the people that pull the trigger. It's, it's upside down. It's upside down bullshit. Let's legislate against people who are good citizens. Let's take the guns from them instead of let's take the guns out of the hands of the people who are shooting people. And let's prosecute the people who are shooting people. When someone gets caught with a legal gun, let's put them in prison. No, they don't want to do, do that. So the world is upside down. And that's one of the reasons all of this anti-police rhetoric and all of this. Um, but when I frame it to my left wing friends, I go, well, it appears from the stats that I've read that it's the minorities that really suffer when the police are defunded. And because they're the people that need the police the most, they're the ones that need the security most. What's your experience in New York with that? I mean, is that the case? Or? Yeah, well, that's, that's 100% true. Uh, when you look at the statistics, People doing the violent crime, um, well, if you look at shootings, say, and murders, 80% of the shootings and the murders are committed by male Blacks and in the neighborhoods that they live, for the most part. Mm -hmm. So when the police stop and question, or the, which became stop, question, and frisk became a dirty word uh, years ago, if they stop people that fit the description of the people 
that are committing these crimes, all of a sudden the cops are racist. Mm. And that's not, uh, we don't want them stopped, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's, an, it's a bad situation, you know? And, and then they, when I spoke about decarceration, there's people with impunity going into stores and just stealing. And there's nothing being done to them. So they're putting stores out of business because they're not arresting these people. And they do arrest them. They're not prosecuted. It's, it's, it's pathetic. That's how a country goes down. It really is. It's how a democracy can wind up uh, a banana republic. See, that's, that's the thing. I, <clears throat> my policing experience was um, disproportionately <clears throat> places like Cairns, which is a regional centre. It's a town of about uh, about 200,000 people, but I did a lot of remote, isolated places, and especially especially in Indigenous communities. So that would be your equivalent of working in uh, First Nations reservations, that kind of that kind of thing. And uh, my experience it tells me that if you're not really cracking down on people who break the law, you are effectively you're you're actually punishing people who obey the law. So, yes, of course, exactly that. You know, I just want to show you something quick. And um, this was written in uh, 2016, and it's called The War on Cops. Mm. And it was written by Heather McDonald. This will explain everything about what we're talking about. Sure. And, and um, she does, she does the, a great job of writing about a difficult subject because whenever race is involved, it's very difficult to... Uh, to tell the truth, actually, you know. Well, well, I'm a great fan of Coleman Hughes. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of him. I don't know if he's in your part of the world. But um, he's uh, an African-American chap who is an academic. And he's, and he, look, he's kind of open about it. He goes, well, you know, yes, I'm concerned about these allegations and everything. But he said the stats, I think he's a sociologist. I may stand corrected on his, on his specific qualifications. But... He kind of says the facts just do not back the narrative. Uh, yes, police officers in America, generally speaking, the stats that he could assess are quicker to go hands on with people who, who are African American. But when you compare, when you use the correct benchmark, which is actual dealing with police, the shooting rates are lower. And the way this things, the way things were framed over here in Australia, when Black Lives Matter came over here, and they did, they actually sent people over to rabble rouse. The way, they, the way they framed it over here was just deaths in custody. So, you know, anyone who died in custody. And long story short, we had an inquiry about this in the early 1990s. It actually started off in the late 80s and it went for, I think, it was three years. Now, I'm actually acquainted with the, with the federal minister who was part of getting that going, a bloke named Gary Johns. And he said, look, the allegations were really serious. Fundamentally, what people were alleging was that, uh, you know, Indigenous people were being murdered by officers of the state in custody right. because there's this really high death rate. And, and so they called a Royal Commission, which over here is the biggest inquiry you can do. Like the government, once a Royal Commission is called, the government loses control of it. it basically, the lawyers get their hot little hands on it, which is an issue, issue in, in and of itself. They, right. get their snouts, they get their snouts into it. Right. The inquiry itself said, look, the stats are clear. A, Indigenous people are not being murdered. That simply is not happening, okay? It just didn't happen. So we need to stop saying that. It did reveal a lot of neglect. And to oversimplify, this was the kind of narrative, especially in remote uh, watch houses, the places that I used to uh, work at. So you're in a country town, there's a, the local drunk is playing up, the cop arrests him, throws him, throws him in, the, in the cell overnight, puts a glass of water with him, goes home, has a sleep, comes back in the morning, guy's dead from a heart attack. You know, right. or he's or he's hung himself, or he, so, something like that. So there was, and, and I've got to say, there was some really serious neglect. Like they just they, they weren't monitoring people, but there were no murders, um, and no since the end of colonial times, no police officer over here in Australia has ever been found guilty of 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 an unlawful of an unlawful killing. There were some terrible massacres, uh, and and, right. and I mean massacres, like people were massacred. Um, in the in the late 1800s and really right up until the, the last one was in the early 1920s. So that's how kind of recent it, it, recent it is. But we're just not guilty of it. And these facts were being 
these facts were just being ignored. And, and yet the narrative was, was still getting around. One of the things that disappointed me, and I'd like your comment on this, because you have something to do with academia, is any any time that there's a popular narrative, like you get academics on TV and on podcasts going, yes, the stats are saying this, this, and this. The stats validate this narrative. Be, be it whatever it is, you know, climate change or whatever it is, other whatever it is, other issue. They're front and centre there. But on this, because the stats simply weren't there, you, you didn't see them on the media. Now, I don't think it was all the mainstream media. I think a lot of it is, like our... Oh, you know, academics are, are very left-wing, you know, and the thing is they only use statistics, and statistics can be twisted. They can be used to prove a certain point, and they can be used incorrectly. But... The mainstream media, of course, is very liberal, but so are academics, you know? And you'll never see them talk about something that doesn't fit their ideology, you know, like what you're talking about. Mm. The statistics doesn't fit the narrative, but they'll never talk about, <clears throat> talk about that. Well, I've always wondered why. I mean, for me, the issue is why, because, you know, they, and I try and talk to a lot of academics here in Northern Vibe, and all the ones I've spoken to have been, have been excellent. One of them, uh, actually, one of the ladies did, did articulate. She goes, well, look, Matt, you've got to understand what like, you're in the police. You, you have the warrior mindset. You're a fighty. You don't see yourself as a fighty sort of person, but you're not scared of confrontation. And, you know, you're not, you don't feel the need to back down and, and keep the peace. You, you're, you're willing to go there. That's a mindset. And a lot of academics simply just don't have that. They're, they're not that sort of person. So I wonder how much I wonder how much character impacts on on that as well. Besides ideology, I thought that, okay, that was I think it's also it also has to do whether they've ever been threatened before. Have they ever had a gun stuck in their face? Hmm. No, have they ever had a knife pulled on them? Yeah. Have they ever had someone threaten their life? Yeah. Maybe they would understand better if that happened to them. You know. Yeah. And I'm not advocating that. That. No, of no, course not. I know, I know what you mean. It, what you know, we call people in New York City limousine liberals. And that means someone goes from a limousine to their doorman and never has to deal with the outside world. They don't ride the trains. They don't walk among uh, the unwashed, <laughs> to use that term, right? Yeah, the they don't walk unwashed. among the street people. So we call them limousine liberals. Or we used to say the definition of a conservative is a liberal that just got mugged. <laughs> Watch how a liberal changes his philosophy after he gets the shit kicked out of him and relieved of his wallet, you know? <laughs> But look, how much of a, I mean, you, you spoke at the beginning of this robbery that you were subject to. How much of a issue is crime in, in New York? Like stuff like that. Well, you know, in the night, in the, um, before the Blasio became, became mayor, so eight years ago, he was the most, the worst disaster that ever happened to New York City. He came in as a progressive, woke mayor. He was more of a, a leftist than, than even the people that voted for him. He destroyed New York City in eight years. New York City, before he became mayor, was the safest large city in the world. Because through broken windows policing, yeah. uh, they had lowered the crime rate to like less than, I think there was less than 400 murders a year, around, and low 300s. And in the 1990, there was 2,200 murders in New York City. Wow. And they lowered it to less than 400. So think of how many more people were alive because of the broken window style policing. You can look at any index crime. Robberies went down from hundreds of thousands to like an acceptable level. And robbery used to be the barometer. If you had a precinct or a district and your robberies were up, that was sort of the barometer to all your crime. If your robberies were up, your crime in your precinct was gonna be up across the board. And now, with the seven major crimes, they're not paying as much attention because we, well, they blame it on COVID, but really it's not prosecuting people, not putting people in jail, not putting people in prison, not holding people accountable. That's what it is. Uh, it's easy for them to, to, to blame uh, COVID, but uh, the only way you can blame it a little bit on COVID is that the courts aren't processing the cases. There's been guys arrested for carrying a gun, an illegal gun, five times in a year, and they still haven't gone to court. Wow. Look, my, my only kind of concern is, because, again, you've probably picked up, 
I'm not academically trained, but I do know a lot of academics and I do mind competent best to read as much as I possibly can. And um, when I say prison doesn't, prison doesn't work, what I mean by this, what I mean is this, it works when you, because you get that particular perpetrator to use the Americanism, ALF. And if that person is a serious violent criminal who's causing you know, a, a lot of pain in the community, and that happens a lot in, in the Indigenous communities that I used to work at, like you used to get these guys, it's, it's strange because they would be described by the courts and by the academics as this person is powerless and disadvantaged. So what you don't understand is in, that, in this community, this person, is a, this person is an alpha male. This person is the person to be feared in that street. But nothing happens in that street without that person's go ahead. They get the women, they get the booze, they get the, you know, they get what they want. So compared to compared to the community, I suppose you could say using that benchmark, they're kind of disadvantaged. But in their own little ecosystem, <laughs> they're far from they're far from disadvantaged. Right. And would and and so I, you know, I used to, and look, even using this language makes me nervous, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't be targeting people. You'd be targeting offending behaviour. But if you've got two people in the community that are engaging in all the offending behaviour, you have to target those people. You know, you, yes. It's kind of like, I mean, you're, you're the criminals. You're keeping, you are keeping the community in fear. Um, and you get this flip. You, you would find it too, I'm sure, over there. Um, if the if the, if this criminals are scared of the community and the police, you're winning. It's like good. It's like, oh, I mean, you know, they're only going out at night. You know, they're sneaking around. They're, they're kind of what they're afraid of you. They're, they're the cockroaches scuttling around in the dark places where we can't see. Right. But it doesn't take much to flip it over and get it so that the community, especially, and the police and the courts are scared of the criminals. And no, that so then, Matt, one, to put it to the lowest common denominator, I don't know how you grew up or, or, or what you learned, but if there was a bully, and you, you went home to your dad or your mom and you said, this guy's bullying me. I know my father would said, punch him right in the nose. Hit him right in the nose. Even if he kicks your ass, hit him. That's the only thing that bullies understand, right? You can compare that to a, a criminal like you're talking about. And in correctional philosophy, there's something called deterrence. Hmm. And deterrence is general and there's specific. So for this bully, who's terrorizing a neighborhood, he needs very specific deterrence. He needs to be locked up and he needs to put in, be put in a cage. And when you do that to him, there's something called general deterrence, and that's for the rest of the population. Would-be bullies, would-be guys who are terrorizing the community, they, oh, no, I can't do it because he was put in jail. He was put in prison. So there's general and specific deterrence. If there's no deterrence, what's going to stop these incorrigible types, these criminal types, from playing their trade. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, the, the academics I discuss always raise this point, and in Australia it's definitely true because we have 80% reoffending rates. Um, and it almost seems, actually, if you go to jail, it almost guarantees you to be a reoffender. Whereas if you kind of, if you're kept out of the system, uh, because it becomes a finish, you know, I don't, I don't know what the prisons are like in America, but it's finishing school. That that's where you go. To it, it is, it is, but you got to make a decision. Who deserves to be protected? The criminal in the prison or the or the victim? Yeah. That's going about their life, working their job, trying to raise their family, doing the right thing. So we're worried that this guy's gonna reoffend, or we're worried about this person's gonna be smacked on the back of the head with a bat, or this guy relieves them of their wallet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. There's, a society has to make a decision, and you can do both. You can use specific deterrence, put them in prison, and you can use diversion programs like what we've been talking about. Yeah. For the people that aren't too far gone, you can use uh, counseling, you can use uh, yeah. drug, drug uh, rehab, alcohol rehab, all those feel-good programs. But if it doesn't work, then you got to get back to specific deterrence. And then there's something else called incapacitation, and that's for the very worst. And for the very, very worst that are just career criminals that are scourged to society, incapacitation makes sure that they're taken out of the uh, out of the mainstream and put in jail or prison forever. Yeah. That's called incapacitation. You're just, you are not getting out, buddy. So, no. yeah, I mean, the, the problem, 
the dilemma I always face when I'm, when I'm speaking with, with my friends like that is they say, hey, look, prison doesn't work in as much as that person, like, it, you know, it doesn't rehabilitate pe people. And, and that that much is true. So, I mean, it does seem like a... But, yeah, but Matt, it's not supposed to specifically rehabilitate. It's supposed to punish. You, know, right. you people talk about rehabilitation, but guess what? That if, that if we can do that too, fine. But it's also supposed to punish you. Because you did something wrong. So you're getting punished. No one wants to sit in, in a six by eight foot cell for 10 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you did something that put you there. And you didn't do one thing. Most of the time you did 20 things or yeah. 30 things because that's how long it takes you for someone to get incarcerated in the United States. Yeah, it's the same in Australia. You actually have, well, again, when I discuss this, and, I, and I've, been, I've actually been in trouble, like I've caused trouble at meetings and stuff like that, or if you have an academic speaking and they kind of say, look, and I said, look, you don't really understand the nature. I've seen, you know, respectfully, sir or ma'am, you don't understand the nature of how the court systems work here in Australia. You have to take a running, like you, it's almost, you've got to focus on getting to jail because we, uh, we don't have anywhere near enough jails. We just don't. Um, they're already full. So they're the, and it's, and it's open. It's really open. Like you can go and read these documents uh, for all the listeners out there. If you don't believe me, the, the sentence, the sentencing guidelines say like, the prisons are full. Don't send in there unless you absolutely okay. want to have to. Um, well, you see, the policies of your country and Europe and other countries is what's driving the new trade winds of the United States of having decarcerable policies because we are the our country has the most people incarcerated of any free country in the world. So people point to that and they go, "Oh my God, look at this free country!" And they're putting poor people in prison, you know, and Look, I think that when you do specific crimes, you need to be punished. And, mm. you know, what better way to punish that you put them in jail or prison? I mean, what else is there? What else are you going to do to them? Diversion? That doesn't work, you know? So how do you punish these people? And, you know, these liberals that talk about, you know, decarceral policy, ask them where they live. Yeah. They live nowhere near these criminals. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're in the and wall, the state. They get home at night, they, they're driving their car. Or do they ever take public transportation? Do they ever do this? No, because they're far away, or they can afford gated communities or private security. So these people are all full of shit, these academics. They really mm -hmm. are. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the big thing in the United States. We have a big problem with homelessness. And homelessness is a catch all word that is also nonsensical. Homelessness really means alcoholic, drug addicted, mentally ill person. The last part, homeless, that is the part they're living on the street because of those three previous conditions I just told you about. Mm. Alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental illness. Not, the, not having enough homes is really not the biggest part of that equation. It is part of it, but it's not the biggest part. So what do these geniuses let them do, these woke progressives? They let them live on the street or in the subways. Guess what? You can't sit in the subway now with about 10 homeless people and their mental illness is laying on the seats that you're supposed to be sitting on as you drive to work. Mm. Is there easy solutions to any of these things? No, there is not. But the thing is, people, homeless people that are mentally ill, alcoholics and drug addicted, they do not belong living on the street where they endanger everyone because... They go off their medication or they never go on their medication and they're taking time bombs, lots of them. Well, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about this night shelter guy that I spoke to, because it was get, it was at the height of the Black Lives Matter thing over here. And it was right at the end of the interview after I'd switched off the recording part when we were just talking. And he said, hand on heart, the Queensland police are just so professional. It just, I've never seen anything but kindness. I've never seen, and like, I, mate, I was genuinely moved by this five minute tirade. And I bet, I bet it's the same uh, over there because when I did my Churchill Fellowship, the thing I, the thing I investigated was the uh, police response to mental health crisis situations. So of course I was talking to cops, but I was also talking to clinicians, social workers and, and people like that. And of course, uh, people with mental illness. So like I was dealing with a lot of the homeless and, uh, you know, uh, in Maui over in Hawaii, there's a massive homeless problem over there because the weather's so nice. 
and of course Los yeah, Angeles. Just, same thing in San Diego, San Diego, San Diego California. They were literally doing that. Van. They were literally doing that. Like what what was happening? Well, one of the problems was some some of the jurisdictions in America were sitting there going, "Well, it costs us this much money to treat this person. It costs a ticket to Maui costs this much." I'm not making this up. They were putting people on the planes, but like, and because the weather's beautiful in Maui. Hey, so, how is that? Any, how is that any different than the president of the United States flying illegal aliens to cities in the middle of the night and letting letting them go in different cities? That's right. Yeah. Is that any different? That's outrageous too, isn't it? Yeah. But um, yeah, mate. I just but speaking to the people over at um, speaking something I found really reassuring, and it's it's one of the findings in my report. Was a really I didn't keep the actual stats, but I would I would say. I would say at just under half of the people who had serious mental illness, who had dealings with the police, including those incidentally who had force used against them, were saying, well, look, yeah, like the, the police are kind of good. Like I've, I've found, generally speaking, they're, they're professional. Um, one of the quotes that sticks in my mind is like, you know, I'm not a really nice person and I'm kind of like that. And the police have always been kind of good. So it, it seems to be really funny. Like the closer you are to the police, um, and this included in most American jurisdictions and, and definitely in Canada, there seemed to be an actual high amount of respect. I wouldn't say affection, but I would say respect for the, for the police over there. Whereas the people who are more distanced in these academic positions were the ones that had serious contempt. They were like, oh, the cops are racist, the cops are... And, and these, you know, these people would openly be saying this to me. It's like, no, you've you got to see what's over here. This is you know, serious problems with institutional violence, serious violence problems with you know institutional racism and, and look it kind of like obviously being part of the tribe it kind of it, it kind of bothered me uh, but like I was never in a position to challenge that because I just didn't know the stats I didn't, I didn't know anything that, about that and, and yeah. I would imagine that there would be some jurisdictions over there so you've got the sheriff of pig slop Idaho or wherever it is you know he hasn't got a lot of money uh, he can't train his guys they're nothing more than kind of like security guards with badges um, you know, maybe that's true. There are there are American cities that have that problem. Yeah, they don't have a lot of money to pay their police. Um, you know, the, the one thing that you'll see that academics and the press, politicians there, whenever something goes wrong with the police, they say they need more training. But you know what? They're full of shit because they don't want to pay for the training. Because training costs lots of money. Yeah. And training also takes cops off the road. Yes. So yes. when you say this guy needs, oh, how much training does he need? He needs 100 hours a year, 200 hours. Okay, great. Cops love training. Yeah. But guess what? The police department doesn't love training because they can't pay for it. And you same jackasses that are saying they need more training, you just defunded the NYPD by a billion dollars. What are we going to pay for this training? <laughs> Were you guys actually defunded? Did that actually happen over there? They def- yeah, one billion dollars, but they, they did some creative things. They had school safety was under the police department's budget. They're not real cops. So they took them and put them under something else. So whatever amount of money that maybe that was a half a bill. I don't know exactly what it was. So they did some creative management like that, but they still lost a lot of money. And one of the most important things you need for policing is you need overtime money. And especially for investigations, if you have a murder, you know, you got to pay those detectives because they're not going home, for, you know, 48, 60 hours, whatever. They're going to work straight. But guess what? If you say, sorry, we can't pay you, they will be like, see ya, I'm going home. I'm no volunteer. I'm a capitalist. I get paid, you know? And you know what it's like to work crazy overtime. Not only does it affect you, it affects your family. You're not around, you know? It beats the shit out of your body. So can you imagine them saying, oh, Sergeant Cannon, um, we know you had a murder, but you and your whole team can go home. You think that's going to motivate us to do that job or to find who did this? We'd be like, oh, really? Okay, see ya. You know? Yeah. We'll never find that guy. But they, And they know that. They know that. So certain units, they allow to work more overtime. What they try to pull the overtime is from patrol, regular patrol cops. And so obviously these <clears throat> that defunding had a real effect on, on law and order in, in New York. 
I yeah, hundred percent, and not just New York, but in cities across the country. Do you know, because some of the stuff that I've heard about Chicago, are you in a position to talk much about that? Do you know about these stats over there? Oh, yeah, well, Chicago, Chicago is a war zone. Chicago is an absolute, every weekend, hundreds of people get shot in Chicago. Wow. And their murders are up. And, you know, it's all from the, the, the um, incompetent government. Chicago is out of control. So is Portland. So is all the um, Baltimore. All these places that have these woke defund the police. A lot of them are begging them, cops. The old time is the cops that can retire, they leave. I don't need this shit anymore, I'll just retire. Mm-hmm. So they lost lots of the experienced cops, you know? And uh, I don't know how long it'll take the NYPD to recover from that. But when you see the job now, most of the cops, they have less than 15 years on the job, the majority of them, you know? Yeah. So you lose all the experienced cops that teach the younger cops how to do the job, you know? And the job has changed so much the last few years, because cops are afraid to put their hands on people, because they, you know, basically uh, been told hands off, you know. And that's it. And you know, I'd explain that to people who, who didn't go. I go, look, you got to understand. When push comes to shove, yes, we care about these things. Yes, the reason I joined the police service was because you know I have a <clears throat> concern about law and order, duty, um, want to stand up for what's right, and all those kind of stuff. But ultimately, it's a job. And if you punish me for doing the job, so if I get in trouble for uh, if I get in trouble for getting out there, um, I'm getting hands on with people because you know not everyone comes quietly. You know I'm arresting I'm arresting people they're fighting or whatever it is, and I get punished for that. Guess what I don't do? I don't do that. Right. Because you know I get paid the same amount of money. Right. You stop regardless. being proactive. You, you, yeah. You know. So if you if you, if you punish it, that's that's what happens. But look. And looking at the surnames of officers in the NYPD, like those two officers that were killed just recently, it doesn't, you know, I'd like you to comment on this, it doesn't actually appear to be a kind of like Anglo-Saxon dominated organisation, to be candid. No, I think that in the last few years, uh, more than the last few years, last 10, 15, 20 years, they've made a concerted effort to try to recruit more African-Americans, more Hispanic people, more minority people, Asians, or people from all different uh, the cop that shot and killed the perp in the, uh, with the, who killed the two police officers from the three two, he's it for he's Indian, from India. You know, brilliant, got a brilliant job, a hero. You know, but so the two cops who were killed were Dominican. The cop that shot and killed them was from India. So it, it's pretty amazing. And I'd say fifty percent of um, NYPD now is non-white. There's, there's, there's just a case right now. I forget which city it's in. The police were doing a search warrant. The subject of the search warrant pointed a gun at one of the cops, and the cop shot and killed him. They're like, the, the Black Lives Matter is yelling for the arrest of the cop. Like, there's something called justification. There's no crime there. But, the, you know, it's scary that they try to pacify these groups, and, and, and they don't care what the law is, you know? Ferguson, Missouri, who was in, the, in 2016, a cop uh, went to stop this guy who had just committed a robbery at, at a store. And the robbery was, a, it was like a strong arm robbery. He took a pack of cigars. The owner went to stop him. He just fucking pushed him out of the way. Anyway, he went to stop him. And the, Michael Brown, who was the, the perp in this, he grabbed the cop's gun. And the cop was sitting in the radio car. The cop shot and killed him. At no time was there ever... Uh, he, did he say hands up, don't shoot? But the guy who was with him lied and said that happened, and the riots started almost immediately. And they now call that the Ferguson effect as to why cops throughout the country don't want to do anything because of this cop was right, and they they put him through hell, and he got fired too, even though he was one hundred percent correct. He got fired. They paid Michael Brown's family millions, even though he was wrong. So this is the politics that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, it's and, and the whole thing about having a law and justice administration system is you're supposed to know the outcome. If I do this, I am okay. If I do this, I will get punished. It's not about what you, what skin color you are, what job you're doing, what everything else. It's like did the, it's about the act. And once we right. once we step, once we once we blur those borders, like you said, we're actually in, it's. 
people say this hyperbole, but I don't think it is. Like that's you're undermining Western civilization. It's not just democracy that you're undermining. No, you're 100. percent It's uh, there's good guys, there's bad guys, and there's right and there's wrong. Mm. And when you you punish someone for being right and you don't punish someone for being wrong, the world's upside down. Yeah, exactly. But mate, look, could you mind telling me? Um, but that's a great story about just before you joined. Would you mind telling us about your career? Uh, yeah, well, I, I came on, I was 28 years old. I graduated the police academy. I went to a precinct. First, you go for training, field training. And we worked out of four precincts, the two, the 19th, the 2-0, the 2-3 in Central Park. The 2-3 was the busiest precinct, violence-wise, out of all of those precincts. Because the 2-3, Spanish Harlem, it's known as El Barrio. And it has housing, the most housing projects of any precinct in the city. So there was very poor people living there. So I trained there for six months. And then I went to a precinct on the Upper West Side, the 20th precinct, which was a slow precinct. It wasn't really that busy, but slow by the standards back then. You know, we would get 60 or 80 robberies a month, but that was slow for 1985, you know. And I worked there, and then my goal was to get into plain clothes. And I wound up getting into plain clothes very early. I just had a year and a half on the job. Because I, I made five or six armed robbery arrests my first six months. And one of them, the last one was the armed robbery of a bank with a sawed-off M130 carbine. And my commanding officer loved it so much, he put me in plain clothes right after that. So then I worked plain clothes there for, um, I guess, about two and a half years. And then I went to a unit called the Street Crime Unit, which was doing exactly what I was doing, but on a citywide basis. We would go to the busiest precincts in the entire city and go after street robberies, guns, things like that. And then with four years and 10 months on the job, I got promoted to sergeant. And then I get I went back. Um, and to make sergeant and or lieutenant or captain of the police department, it's a civil service exam. It's not an appointment. So I passed the test. I got promoted. I went to a precinct on near Columbia University, 2-6, for my six-month training. Then I went to another precinct in the, on the Upper West Side, 2-4, 100 Street. Uh, and I stayed there from 1990 to 1995. And in 1995, I got um, promoted to an investigative unit. It was called the RIP unit. And I was in charge of 12 detectives in a robbery unit. And we investigated robberies. I did that for two years in the 2-4. Then I got transferred to the 2-3 on the um, El Barrio in Spanish Harlem. And I had the robbery unit there for a bunch of years, and I went into the detective squad. And then in 2002, I got transferred to Manhattan North Homicide Squad, and I was there for the rest of my career of almost 27 years. And that was it. <laughs> wow, crikey. And, uh, yeah, 27 years, mate, no parole. So what was your, um, what was your most satisfying job? Uh, homicide was great. I loved working in homicide. I loved working all over different precincts. You weren't confined to one precinct. I liked working with the different detectives from the different squads. I had a team of six detectives and we would respond to murders and shootings and major cases. And that was definitely the best unit. Yeah, I, I had a good time working there. Have you got a specific job that actually sticks in your mind, like a specific case? Uh you know, I, I, I went on so many murders. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, there were the high-profile ones, the um, the one on the on 101st Street where um, these two guys were hired to murder this woman. And uh, because it's the, I try to cut to the chase, she owned a brownstone on 101st Street with her ex-husband who lived on the third floor of the same building. His new wife hired these guys to kill her so that she would own the building with her new husband. So they went to kill her and she was there with her boyfriend. So they killed both of them. Cool. That was an interesting case. And that was a real high profile case. But I like this here's, here's one that's pretty bizarre. We got called to an apartment on 103rd Street on, in the 23. And these two young cops said, I saw these guys run out of this apartment with a duffel bag. And it was blood was pouring out of the duffel bag. They threw it in the back of this van and they took off. 
So we go up to the apartment. There's blood all over the apartment, but no body. So the next day, they discover the body on 119th Street with the head was cut off. The body was over here and different body parts all over. That was the body from this job on 103rd Street. And uh, when they recovered the body, the guy's face was cut off from the head. And his uh, fingers were cut off his hands because they obviously didn't want him to get identified. Yep. And there were signs of um, torture, all like cigarette burns on his arms and stuff. Yeah. Usually when you see <clears throat> violence at that level, it has something to do with drugs. And this was all about drugs. The victim was sticking up drug locations in Brooklyn. And that's not a good job for longevity, for lifetime longevity. So they invited him to a party on East 103rd Street. And they tortured him and cut his head off and all, all of that stuff. And that was one of the weirdest jobs. Yeah, crikey. All right. And of course, that leads us to, uh, it's a great segue into comedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what happened? When I, I, when I, um, I was actually still teaching, I just thought, you know, so let me see. I took a comedy class, an eight week stand up comedy class. And the graduation is you perform at a comedy club for like, you do like five minutes. So I was like, I always wanted to try it. So I took the course and and I uh, performed, and then I wound up doing it for like six or seven years. And the only thing that made me stop was um, the pandemic. I just, it's, it's such a hustle. You know, I live outside the city. I have to drive into the city. I have to go here. You got to go there. You got to get up on stage two or three times a, a week just to keep your chops up. And then I also started acting. I was taking acting classes. I did six episodes of this TV show called The Perfect Murder, where I played a, a detective. And um, you can actually watch it. It's on Investigation Discovery. And I did two episodes, uh, uh, six episodes. Four, I played the detective. And two, I was just a talking head. I played myself. I was, you know, Sergeant from the Manhattan North Homicide Squad. And I commented on the case. So I did, you know, I did stand-up comedy for like six years, seven years. And then I was doing acting. I was auditioning for commercials and stuff. And then the pandemic hit, and I'm just like, I got really involved in the podcast and this is all I'm doing now. You know? That's great. And all right. Uh, so for, for Queensland uh, viewers, it's called police off the cuff and tell us what you do. You know, we started out just doing uh, interviews of cops that had great careers and to sort of memorialize their careers in a podcast, talk about what they did, where they worked, uh, Got a lot of guys, we had a lot of superheroes that were involved in numerous shootings. Uh, we had, you know, helicopter pilots, um, investigators. We had guys that, um, what was this one guy who was a brilliant uh, combat cross winner at two years on the job, went to Af Iraq when he retired from the police department, then came back from Iraq and went to Afghanistan. So. These guys had amazing stories. We would tell their stories. But then it was like, it's, you can't just keep doing a show just that. It's sort of a narrow focus. Mm -hmm. So we started, I branched out into real crime stories. 